Hello and welcome to Emmanuel's online service. My name is Bryn and it's great that you can join us whenever you might be doing so. Well, one of the reasons that we meet together regularly, be it online or in person, is to re be reminded and to remind one another that there is no better use of our life than using it to serve Jesus. You see, we are made to have a relationship with the God who made us. But the thing is, despite knowing this to be true and believing it, there can often be this conflict in us. See, on the one hand, we know that the best possible thing we can do and the best possible thing we can have in our life is a deep relationship with God. But on the other hand, we want to do a bunch of things that we know God says are wrong and aren't actually good for us according to God. And so in our weakness, we need to learn and relearn the truth that there is nothing better than having a good relationship with the Lord. We need to be reminded that he is good, he is dependable, and he is trustworthy. And he's all those things even when obeying him is really hard. I want to read from Psalm 86 as we open our service. And in it, David prays to God that he would help him to trust during a difficult time in his life. Here's what he prays. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. And then it seems as if God answered his prayer because he goes on to say, I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love towards me. You have delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead. So let's be reminded that walking faithfully with the Lord, even when it's hard, is actually the best thing that we can do with our lives. It is the thing that will bring us the most joy in our lives. Well, I'm going to hand over to the band now, and they're going to sing God's praises. Why not sing with them?
in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Well, to those of you who don't know, this last week, Luan Stoop joined the Emmanuel staff team. He's come on as an assistant minister, and his primary focus will be looking at kids, teens, and young adults ministry. And as a way to get to know Luan and his family and to welcome them into our church family, Louis sat down with them the last week and he asked them a few questions. And we're going to watch that interview together now. Good day, Emmanuel. It's uh, great to be together again and welcome to our first uh, Sunday in February. It's a great joy for me to welcome uh, the Stoops to us uh, on staff officially. Luan joining us from the 1st of February. I'm going to hand over to Luan, maybe just to introduce yourself and your family to us, please. Uh, yeah, my name is Luan and uh, this is my wife, Joni, and our daughter, Lily. And we're very excited to be um, involved here at Emmanuel again. Um, it's been, um, I think, 10, 11 years since we've been here. So we're very excited. Wonderful. Um, Luan, will you share a little bit with us just your journey of faith, which started here at Emmanuel? So will not you share with us um, how you have come to faith and grown in your faith? Yeah, sure. Um, I always thought I was a Christian. I grew up in a kind of a nominal Christian home where um, my parents thought... Um, it took us to church every now and again, so I thought I was right with the Lord. Um, but it wasn't until I actually came to Emmanuel and joined the youth group um, with my friends um, from hockey, and I started realizing that I didn't know Jesus as my Savior. I was a sinner, and, and if I didn't confess my sins and trust Jesus, Jesus that I would um, not be in relationship with Him. And so I think it was um, during my time under Jacques and being here at youth that I think beginning of my matric year that I um, came to know Jesus and uh, he worked in my life by his spirit and I repented and trusted in Jesus and I keep doing that daily and um, yeah my journey then continued as I joined the youth team and started um, serving on, on in ministry and learning about what it is to be part of the body and then yeah then I did an apprenticeship here at one stage I learned what it means to be in full-time ministry and so, yeah, my journey at Emmanuel has been a, a, a very um, important one and um, one that I'm very grateful for. And so it's really good to be back and uh, to a place where it all kind of began for me. And so I'm looking forward to serving, yeah, the body here and, and, and using the gifts and, and the things I've learned at Tigerberg to, to serve the body here, yeah. Great. Um, Joni, tell us a little bit about how you guys met. Obviously, Luan, we knew him as an individual, young, energetic guy. He settled down with Lily as well now, uh, recently. But tell us a little bit about how you guys met and, and your journey as a couple. Well, we, um, I grew up in Amanis, so we had quite a small church and youth group there. So I used to come regularly through to the Cutting Edges, and I was a regular attendee at Crossword Cape Youth Camp. And at the time, Luan was a leader there, but uh, don't worry, he only approached me when I was uh, finished with school. <laughs> and he asked me for a coffee, and we actually sat down and had a discussion about our intentions. And right on our first date, we spoke about the prospect of dating intentionally for marriage so uh, we always knew where we were going regarding our relationship mm. and uh, as I say the rest is history we got engaged two years later and we've been married this is our seventh year now that we Seven already. That yes. we married yeah. Wonderful. So. and Lily 
sweet Lily. So yes. tell us a little bit about what Lily loves and how long you've had Lily and yeah, just a little bit more about her. So this is Lily Grace um, <laughs> and she has been with us since the 3rd of November. That's her homecoming day. She was born on the 25th of June yes. last year. Yes, you were. <laughs> yes. And she is an absolute bundle of energy and joy. Um, she has really brought a light to our life that we didn't know um, was missing. She is a social bunny. She loves seeing people and meeting new people. She's very intelligent. She always makes eye contact. She loves learning new things. She loves being outdoors, always looking at the trees and the flowers. Not so interested in toys at the moment. And um, yeah, she's progressing through her milestones quite quickly. So it's been an interesting journey with her. Wonderful. Well, we look forward to seeing her and both of you grow um, in your ministry, but also in your love and understanding of the Lord. Uh, Luan, just uh, very briefly, um, tell us what are you looking forward to the most as a family as you start your kind of second journey here at Emmanuel Church? Yeah, obviously I'm not as young as I used to be. <laughs> and I have a daughter now and, and a wife compared to when I was first here. Uh, but I think we look as a family, we're looking forward to um, just opening up our home and getting people into our home and um, and just being intentional about um, building relationships with people here at Emmanuel. And then obviously on a personal um, basis, I'm really looking forward to um, looking at what children and youth and young adults um, has to offer here and how we can um, grow ministry and, and seek to um, uh, have the Lord just impact those different ministries uh, under my guidance and um, working with Bryn, I'm really looking forward to that. So yeah, so I think we're looking forward to just connecting with people um, and having them in our homes and um, yeah, just being on a disciple journey with people and um, we're really looking forward to that. Oh, wonderful. We look forward to Luan and Joni and Lily serving us uh, and serving with us here at Emmanuel Church and we're going to see much more uh, of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that, Stoop family. We look forward to getting to know you more as we work together as members of Christ's body. Well, I just have a few things to mention by way of notices. The first thing is that tonight at half past six, we're gonna be starting what's called Let's Pray Together. The name really says all you need to know. It's a time that's devoted to praying together. So we'll meet for a short 30 minute prayer meeting over Zoom. And can I encourage you to be there? Prayer is one of the primary ways in which God chooses to act in his world. It's actually a privilege to be able to pray. So let's make use of that privilege. Let's lift up the needs of us and of our world to the one who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or even imagine. And secondly, please do consider giving towards the ministry at Emmanuel. The details are on screen and especially consider doing so if you consider Emmanuel to be your home church. Well, that's it for notices. I'm going to hand over to Elizabeth and Johan now. Those are two of our growth group leaders and Elizabeth will pray for us. And after that, Johan will read from God's word. And after the reading, Louis will preach from that passage. Our mighty and powerful Father in heaven, we come before you today as your children praising you for your power that we can see in your word and around us. We see your power clearly through your word where you resurrected your only son from the dead and raised him up to sit at the right hand of God, above everything else forever. There is none more powerful than you, having all power over life and death. We read in Ephesians that this power also dwells and works in us to believe. Through this we see your love for us, that you gave your only son as ransom for our sin. Through your Son we can come before you, not as sinners, but as forgiven believers. As believers we have many seasons in our lives, from feeling joyful to grieving, and feeling close to you to feeling far from you. Yet you promise us that you are always with us. We thank you that you have carried us through difficult times, trials, hardships, as well as joyful times. We are aware that we need you in our lives, your grace, your strength, and your power. Help us to keep our focus on you, and forgive us when our attention got distracted by earthly things or people before coming to you. Help us to rest our faith not on human wisdom, but on the power of you, Lord. Thank you for providing new hope, peace, and joy through Christ our Saviour. Thank you for the gift of faith, which you work in us through your Holy Spirit. Please open our hearts so we may grow in your knowledge and grow closer to you. 
we would like to bring before you those who have not yet faith in you. Most of us know someone close to us who is not a believer, a husband or wife, a child, a parent or a close friend. Lord, open their hearts to you, so they may also receive the riches of your grace. We struggle when someone close to us rejects your faith. Help us grow in the knowledge that you are in control of everything. Help us to persevere in your trust and confidence, so we can be an image of you you for those around us who do not believe. Lord, you know that at the moment we are unable to come together as your church in person. It is hard for us to worship you without the close contact of all the members of your church. It is sometimes difficult to keep our focus on you without the encouragement of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Therefore, we ask you that we that you may bring an end to the lockdown so we can come together again in one building as one congregation. But for as long as this is not possible, we ask you to strengthen our faith, for your Holy Spirit to work in our hearts by keeping us focused in your word and encouraging one another virtual with your scriptures and blessings. Help us to keep praying for each other. Have your Holy Spirit step in for us when our prayers fail. We know that the more time we spend in your word and in prayer with you, the more we draw closer to you. Even if we feel far from you, Help us to keep on praying and reading your word, for you promise that you are always with us. Tonight we will come together as a virtual congregation in prayer. Please bless this prayer meeting, so we may be awed by your power that works in and around us, for your glory. For some of us it is difficult to pray, but we know that you know what is in our hearts, so that even if we can't find the words, we know that you hear us. As believers, we put our trust and confidence in you. Please fill us with your almighty presence, so our faith may grow in you, and we may live in you. I would like to end with the words from Revelations, praise and glory, and wisdom, and thanks, and honor and power, and strength be to our God, for ever and ever. Amen. Today's reading is from Ephesians 1, verses 15 to 23. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you to everyone who has made today's service possible. Indeed, it was great to have Luan and Joni and Lily on board as well. And thank you for everyone who's participated, Uh, the music team, the readers and the prayers. Uh, Wonderful that we can actually join together as a body and serve together. My name is Louis, and I'm one of the assistant pastors here at Emmanuel Church. With the link for the service that we send out, there was a picture that we attached to that. I wonder if you saw that. If you haven't, let's put it quickly on the screen. And I want you, and especially the children, to have a closer look. Can you see what it is? Perhaps you want to pause for a moment and have a closer look. Children, can you see it? There's a 3D image inside this picture. There really is. Some of you may be able to see it, and some of you may not. Kids, if you can see this, won't you ask your parents to send us your answers to our church cell number? I remember when these hidden images came out when I was a teenager. My friends and I, we would stand in front, of, in front of the shop window at Cardi's in Tiger Valley Center for hours as we tried to see such hidden images. For a long time, I thought it was all a big hoax. I was sure that my friends were only pretending to be amazed when they happened to see these images. 
I did not believe that they could see all sorts of cars and objects and animals until the day and the moment came when I saw it for the very first time. And once you get it right, it is actually quite easy to see the mystery that lies within each picture. Christianity is a bit like these hidden images. Either you behold the wonderful truths of the gospel, or you do not. It all depends on who or what you focus your eyes on. Now in Ephesians, the letter that we started last week, we see that Paul fixes his eyes on Jesus. In the first part of chapter 1, he breaks out into this wonderful prayer of praise as he reflects on the many blessings that he and the church shares in. Blessings that entail how God the Father, through the Holy Spirit, applies the work of Christ to our lives. Of how God has chosen and adopted us to be his beloved children. Of how Jesus, with his blood, paid the penalty for our sins so that we can stand forgiven before God. Of how the Holy Spirit takes up residency in our hearts and in our lives, guaranteeing our eternal place in heaven. God did all this so that when Jesus returns to earth, which he promises he will do, and as verse 10 says there, that he will bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. This is the great mystery, that God is busy calling together a new people, a new humanity for himself from all over the world to spend an eternity with him in the new creation. It is in light of these blessings that Paul now continues his prayer in chapter 1 by giving thanks and making petitions before the Lord for the church. As Paul prays, he highlights various characteristics of the church community. Characteristics that we will do well to keep in mind as we pray for one another. Firstly, we see that here we have a faithful community. Have a look at verse 15. Paul goes on, he says, for this reason, as he reflects on these great blessings that I've just mentioned that uh, is in Christ, he says, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Here we see Paul on a regular basis remembering the church in his prayers. He gives thanks for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This kind of faith is not a superficial head knowledge of the Lord. No, it is a deep personal trust in who God is and what God has done for them. It is a heartfelt understanding of the blessings that we see in verses 3 to 14. This faithful community's allegiance and loyalty lies not with any earthly ruler or false god, but with the Lord Jesus, the true king of this universe. Many in Ephesus have turned away from worshipping Artemis, the fertility god, and various other gods. They've turned away from their wealth and their careers and academic status and sexual promiscuity in order to submit to Jesus. No longer were these other things more important in their life. The most important, important person was, in fact, Jesus. And their faith is evident in their lives. It is accompanied by their love for all the saints, as we read here. A love for all who have been set apart as God's people, all Christians. Now, in the earlier manuscripts, you and you may actually see that in some of your footnotes in your Bible, your love for the saints does not appear there. But that should not concern us, because a genuine faith in the Lord Jesus is marked by love. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, we read, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. This kind of love is not the kind of Valentine's Day kind of love. Love in biblical terms is not an emotion, but a commitment to action for the well-being of another person. Love is not fundamentally an experience. It's ultimately a person. It is Jesus who lays down his life for his church. Paul gives thanks to God for a church who understands what Jesus has done for them. A church who is on fire for the Lord. 
a church that is passionate to make Christ and his works known, a church that is concerned about the eternal well-being of those around them. It is a church that is filled with praise and thanksgiving. Do we, here at Emmanuel Church, regularly pray and give thanks for what God is doing? Now, I know that there are some of you who do this, and I give thanks to the Lord for you doing so. When a church stops giving thanks, it is usually an indication that they are no longer aware of what God is busy doing within the life of that church. The danger is that we can so easily become comfortable and complacent. Uh, we look back to our conversion, the day that we came to know the Lord Jesus Christ for the first time. And we look forward to the day that we will be in glory with, with Christ. And so we, what we do is we place our assurance on these two moments in our lives and we actually forget about the fact that we are called to live for Christ today. And Paul knows that. He knows about this danger, this gospel gap that we refer to it as. And so what does Paul do? Well, he starts praying earnestly for the church after he gives thanks for them. Because he knows a faithful community has several other characteristics. A faithful community is also a growing community. Look at verses 17 there. Verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Paul appeals here to the sovereignty of God, the one whom he knows will hear his prayers, the one true God, creator of all, who answers prayers according to his good purpose and will according to his kingdom. He asks that God will give not the individual, but the church community, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Paul may be referring here to the Holy Spirit or to the Christian spirit. We're not too sure exactly which one it is. Either way, it is the Holy Spirit who is the one who gives a deeper insight into who God is to a Christian and to his church. In John chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus says to his disciples, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit is that part of the Godhead, that person who reveals the truth of God's word to us. And he then gives us the wisdom to understand the word and to apply it. Paul is asking God here to give the church community deeper insight into what God has already revealed to them about himself and his purpose. He wants them to have a better understanding of the spiritual blessings that they already share in. Paul wants the church to know Jesus better, not just a superficial kind of intellectual knowledge, but rather a deep experiential personal knowing of the Lord through his word, a relationship that grows deeper and deeper by the day, for that is where true wisdom is present. When you consider Christianity, what do you see, what do you think about do you see a structure with rules to follow? Do you see a list of requirements to adhere to? Having to attend to church services or Friday youth, Bible studies, prayer meetings, tithing, baptisms and confirmation, and the list goes on? If this is your view of Christianity and church, it is like seeing only the patterns and colors of that picture. You are not seeing the hidden object. Or are you that person who who do you see Jesus? Do you see the mystery that God is revealing to his people of how God the Father and the Son and the Spirit works together in unison to bring all things under the rule of Christ? Of how God wants to use you and me to achieve his very purpose of doing so? When we sit under God's word, it is not to receive just theoretical knowledge of the Bible, no, it is to come face to face with Jesus in community as you allow God to change your heart and life as well as those around you. There is always room left to grow spiritually, to come to know and understand and love God more. As we grow in our understanding of God, so we will grow in our love for him. And as we grow in our love for him, so we grow in our love for others. 
And so let us pray as a church for one another that God will indeed do just that. Well, let's move on to the next characteristic of this faithful community, and that is that it is an enlightened community. Look at verse 18. Paul writes and he says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. The eyes of the heart, as John Stott puts it, are simply our inner eyes which needs to be opened or enlightened before we can grasp God's truth. The heart refers to our entire inner being of who we truly are physically and mentally and spiritually. Paul has already made it clear to the Ephesians that they are in Christ. Their identity lies in him. They are united. They are one with Christ and with one another. And the same is true for you and me if we believe in Jesus. This church here in Ephesus and the surrounding churches that Paul is writing to, they already share in the promise that God made in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 to 27, a promise that is true of us as well, that we share in. Look there what we read in Ezekiel chapter 36. I will give you a new heart, God says, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you, from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. The faithful and growing church community is like those who have already come to see the hidden object in that picture. Their eyes are already open to see the truth of what they have. And yet so often we miss the deeper dimensions of God's grace and his love and what he is busy doing for us. In that image that I sent you and that we put on the screen earlier, there is a large object in it. That's the only hint that I'm going to give you, kids. But it, is also, but it also has some finer details in it. And so, kids, if you can see those, the fuller picture and everything that is in there, let us know. Paul prays that God will reveal to his church more fully what they already have by belonging to Jesus. He wants them to be enlightened so that they may know and experience three realities. Look there at verse 18 and 19. Paul says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know, and here we go, three things, that you may know the hope of which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Let's briefly look at each one of those. Firstly, Paul wants us to know the hope to which God calls you and me, us as a church. This hope entails no longer being slaves to sin, but freedom to live for Christ. It entails being children of God and sharing in all the privileges that accompany it. It entails living peacefully with people from all cultures and backgrounds. It means that when opposition comes our way, that we can stand firm on God's promises. It means we view our present circumstances and suffering in light of the future glory that awaits us. That whatever is happening now is nothing compared to what is coming. It means that we are able to grieve knowing that we will see our loved ones who died in Christ again. When you come to see and know such hope, it radically changes your outlook on life. Secondly, Paul asks God to enlighten our hearts so that we may know the riches of God's glorious inheritance in the saints. God's glorious inheritance is his church, those who belong to him. We are his treasured possession and heirs with Christ. As heirs, God has something magnificent in store for us one day, something that we cannot quite comprehend in this life. It is as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, when he quotes Isaiah chapter 64, verse 4, where we read, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. The blessings we already share in by belonging to Christ is magnificent. As his church, we already experience a part of this heavenly glory that awaits us. And Paul wants us to know these realities on a deeper level. 
He wants us, as he says in chapter 3, verse 18, to grasp how wide and long and how high and deep the love of Christ is and to know that this love surpasses all knowledge. Nothing else in this world can satisfy your desires quite like experiencing God's love and grace. This is all possible because of God's incomparably great power for us who believe, as we read in verse 19, which is the third enlightenment that Paul wants us to experience. And it deserves its own point as another characteristic of a faithful church community. For Paul's entire prayer in chapter 1 boils down to God's great power that the church shares in. And so let us lastly look at a powerful community. Have a look there at the second part of verse 19 and onwards. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. The very power that raised Jesus to life from the dead is ours. The very power that Christ holds as the exalted king is ours. Paul is saying, as one commentator puts it, that God's divine, dynamic, eternal energy is shared by his church. And to get his point across, Paul lists four different Greek words for power in verse 19. We see there dunamis, which is power. It actually translates to what we know as dynamite. And we know how explosive that can be. Then there is energeia, working as in energy. There is kratos, meaning mighty, and iskus, meaning strength. No physical force and no evil power is any match against God's power. And God's power, this power that Paul lists here, is able to change any heart. No addiction, no idol, no sinful behavior, no abusive relationship, no bully, no virus has to destroy your life. Will such things have an impact on your life? Yes, they will. And they won't be easy. But they do not have to rule you. Not even death will have victory over you if you are a believer and part of the church community. It reminds me of what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 to 39, where he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Together with Christ, we as a faithful church community have the upper hand over evil. Let us not become idle. Let us not become comfortable. Let us not become complacent. There's still much work to do and God will work powerfully through us. And so rather, let us remind ourselves of whom we are part of. Look at verse 22. Paul goes on, he says, And God placed all things under his feet, that is, under Christ's feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. As a Christian who has had a powerful transformation of being made alive in Christ, you belong to the church of whom Christ is the head. Without Christ in your life, you are nothing. You are dead in your trespasses and sin. And you may not know it or believe it, but you are in fact ruled by Satan. Just read the next few verses in chapter 2 that we will look at next week. You can share in this life-giving power of God by submitting to Christ today and by becoming part of His church. Now you may not be able to see the hidden image in the picture, but God has made Christ visible to us. That's the most important mystery to behold and to see. He has done so through his word. He is doing so through his church. And one day everyone will see Jesus face to face and have to bow their knee to him. 
Some will say, Lord, Lord. And Jesus will turn around and he will answer, I do not know you. Let that not be you, my friend. You may not like the idea of someone ruling or having power over you. Christ's rule and supremacy over everything is for the benefit of the church. And Paul will go on to explain that for us. What we need to know now, right now, is that the power of God will keep any church community faithful, growing, and enlightened. And we must draw on that power. We must pray for that power. Nowhere in Ephesians chapter 1 does Paul pray about the circumstances of the church. I don't know if you noticed that. Rather, he prays for what truly matters, and that is Christian character. For solid Christian character will bring a godly perspective to your circumstances. No other power in this universe is able to do so. And for this, together with Paul, we must praise and thank God for. We commit one another and every other Christian and church community before the Lord, and we do so in prayer. We pray that they too may know and experience God in a very powerful way. And so do join us on Sunday evenings at 6.30 p.m. for our online prayer meetings. It'll be wonderful to have you part of that. Join a growth group if you haven't yet. Make contact with the church office. And perhaps you want to do so just to hear more about what we have heard from God's word this morning. Perhaps you want to share in this power of God and in his church. And we would love to draw alongside you. Well, let me end with the benediction that we find in the, in, in the middle of this letter, in chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. And a, a benediction that is really so fitting for what we've looked at today. There we read, Paul proclaims, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. In the description of this video, there is uh, some song items that you as a family or as an individual can listen to and praise and thank the Lord for through that. And won't you spend some time praying and uh, reflecting on what God had to say to you uh, today. Until next time. Goodbye.